So what I want to share with you guys today is a spiritual perspective that I would call participatory. And it's a form of participatory spirituality that arises out of the context of this new scientific story of an evolving cos cosmos, an evolving universe. And I'm going to do so from the perspective of a philosopher who I've been studying for a decade now, Alfred North Whitehead. Um, Whitehead's, Whitehead's name has been mentioned um, several times uh, over the course of the last 24 to 36 hours. And he was a British mathematician, physicist, philosopher, who lived through the scientific revolutions of the early 20th century. Relativity theory, quantum theory, which completely demolished the Newtonian clockwork picture of, of a deterministic cosmos, where um, space was just an absolute container and time was um, a you know, linear universal progression, and where particles were just isolated from one another and collided randomly. Relativity and quantum theory undermined this view of the universe, and Whitehead was trying to make sense of these new discoveries replacing an old mechanistic view with what he thought of as an organic view of the universe. And so we're going to delve into his ideas in the second half of this presentation. But first, in order to understand Whitehead and the, the novelty of his thought, we have to revisit the history of science. And I'm going to offer a kind of cartoon history of science, the scientific revolution, which, uh, of course, began, you, you might say, with this fellow, uh, Nicholas Copernicus. And part of the way I want to tell this story of the history of science is it's a bit revisionist, and it might sound different. You're going to hear some things that you maybe didn't learn um, from you know, popular television programs about the history of science. You know, there's been a, a reboot of the Cosmos series where the cosmologist Neil deGrasse Tyson uh, tried to fill the big shoes of, of Carl Sagan. Um, and they tell a version of the, of the history of science that um, I really, I think, magnifies the extent to which there was um, a tremendous conflict between religion, and in, in, in this case Christianity and, and Christendom in Europe, and, and the emergence of science. And the story I want to tell points out the continuities here and even argues for the way in which modern science as we understand it in the West couldn't have emerged anywhere else, or at least it's no surprise that it did emerge in the context of a Christian civilization with the particular form of theology where, as Christian theologians understood God, God was really interested in all the details of how the universe was ordered. Uh, God was rational. And this notion of a God really interested in all the details with power over every little, you know, occurrence in the universe, an omnipotent, omniscient divinity, was what motivated these early scientists uh, creating the human soul so as to be able to under understand the mathematical structure of the universe. This was driving Copernicus, Descartes, Galileo even, Newton. These early scientists didn't see the universe as just a dead machine, really, even though that's the story we're told. Newton thought that, um, you know, he, he described this, this law of gravitation with precise mathematics, but he didn't understand the actual causality of it. He thought angels were pushing the planets around. So here's this guy who is often critiqued for bringing forth by, like, ecological thinkers today, for bringing forth this mechanistic view of the universe, but usually you don't think of angels having any role to play in a mechanistic universe, right? Newton thought that the angels were pushing the planets around in their perfect orbits. Um, so Copernicus, um, of course, developed the heliocentric model of the universe, throwing the Earth into motion. Because the old medieval model was of the Earth at the center of a series of concentric spheres that move stepwise to heaven, and that the elements at play on the earth were very different from these subtler uh, energies, divine angelic energies that, that would rise stepwise to heaven and God would be sort of encompassing 
this geocentric universe um, beyond the final sphere and sort of setting the thing into motion from that perspective. Copernicus didn't invent the heliocentric model. He was studying ancient Greek philosophers and astronomers who had come up with some of these ideas and the mathematics and geometry of it 2,000 years earlier. Some Pythagorean uh, thinkers. So he was you know, reading these ancient texts and using some observations from the old Ptolemaic astronomers and discovered that if you put the, the sun at the center, you can actually come up with a way uh, more, uh, a much simpler uh, geometrical explanation for the motions of the planets. And the motions of the planets have been a problem since ancient Greece because, you know, in a universe that is supposed to be divinely created, if you watch the motions of the planets day after day throughout the course of a year and many years, they often will go retrograde. They move in the wrong direction and they seem to wander. Planet is from the Greek term meaning wanderer. And so there's these strange motions going on and Plato described this as a problem. There needed to be, and he believed there would eventually be a mathematical solution that would explain how what appears to us to be a sort of uh, chaotic motion is actually a deeper harmony. And the heliocentric model that Copernicus developed um, was this deeper harmony that allowed us to understand what appeared to be chaotic motion as actually a deeper harmony. But why was Copernicus driven to do this, this new astronomical research? The Pope wanted to improve the calendar system. It was the Julian calendar at the time. And he needed an astronomer to help, uh, you know, rejigger the the, the calendrical system so that the, the holidays would line up with the astronomical events because the calendar wasn't perfectly aligned with the motions of the heavens and this was throwing things off. So Copernicus was under papal order to improve the calendar system. This isn't a conflict between science and religion, right? This is still a harmony. Now, of course, Copernicus's discovery, which happened in the... Um, mid-1500s um, was disturbing to an old Aristotelian model of the geocentric cosmos and eventually the theologians became uncomfortable with this um, because it challenged their authority and it challenged the authority of the text that they were used to taking uh, as something approaching God's word. So there's a sense in which after Copernicus as, as the uh, philosopher Nietzsche put it, that since Copernicus, humanity has been rolling from the center towards X. And X here means towards the unknown, towards we don't know what. We're not at the center anymore. We're moving through space around a star that's moving around a galaxy that itself is, as Carl Sagan was just describing, uh, one galaxy amidst billions of others in these bubbles. So where are we going? Where do we find our sense of orientation after Copernicus. We were radically decentered by the Copernican discovery. After Copernicus, uh, René Descartes developed his uh, dualistic philosophy that was rooted in a kind of deep skepticism. He questioned his experience of the outside world because for centuries and millennia really, we would look up at the sky and witness the, the stability of the ground beneath our feet, and our senses told us that the earth is stationary and the sky above us is moving. But Copernicus, using mathematics, his deep reflection, rationality, discovered that actually our senses were lying to us. And so if Copernicus decentered us cosmologically, Descartes takes it a step further and says, well, we can't really trust our senses for anything. If we could have been mistaken for so long, about the earth being stationary and the sky being what's moving, then we may be mistaken about a lot more. So Descartes radically um, doubts all of his sensory experience, all everything that his body and his emotion, he, th he says there could be an evil demon deceiving me. But the one thing this demon can't uh, deceive me about is the fact that I am the one thinking, I am the one doubting. And that experience of being the thinker for Descartes was the source, a, a source of certainty that from that inner experience of self-consciousness, he could then build a system of knowledge again. 
which for him was the mechanical universe rooted in geometry. And after Descartes uh, established this, this radically distinct sense of the human subject as a rational, free thinking creature from the rest of nature, which is just matter in motion, obeying these mathematical laws, uh, it set off this chain reaction in, in, in the philosophical uh, world. And uh, Immanuel Kant, pivotal thinker, um, wrote the Critique of Pure Reason in 1781 was the first edition. And, uh, you know, this is, this is not like light bedside reading. Um, this is one of the most difficult books that you'll ever encounter. But what Kant did, um, and I call this the Kantian interval, what, because it's an unstable compromise, he was looking at mechanistic science seeing it explaining the entire universe from this Newtonian and Cartesian perspective according to mechanistic laws. And science from the time of Newton publishing the Principia Mathematica around 1700 to the time of Kant, uh, almost the end of that century, tremendous progress was being made understanding the natural world according to these mechanistic principles. And Kant was worried that this mechanistic form of explanation was encroaching upon our humanity and that human freedom was threatened by the advance of this mechanistic approach to science. So what Kant says is in the preface to the Critique of Pure Reason, he says, I found it necessary to limit knowledge in order to make room for faith. To limit knowledge to make room for faith. And how did he limit knowledge? He was a scientific man. He wasn't trying to say, hey, science, you got to stop. Here's the boundary. Don't cross it. No. He was saying that our scientific knowledge of the outside world is a function of the structure of our own mind. The laws of nature are actually the laws of our own mind. And we don't realize that we're projecting those laws out when we study the natural world. And in that sense, what, we, what science studies is what he called the phenomenal realm. It's nature as it appears to us through our particular form of sensory experience and through our particular mental categories. So the mind filters reality for us before we ever access it. We don't see reality in itself, which for Kant, he called that the, the noumenal realm, and we can now talk about noumenal experiences where it seems like maybe we're, we're penetrating this, this uh, film of our projected experience, and we're getting beyond that to something um, that we've never experienced before. But Kant thought that this, this separation between the phenomenal realm of what we experience based on the structure of our own mind and senses was entirely distinct from the realm of things in themselves, the noumenal realm. So Kant is limiting our knowledge and saying science is studying this phenomenal realm. What's on the other side of that phenomenal film is a mystery. I mean, Kant was leaving it a mystery to make room for things that he thought were essential to human morality, human freedom. So it's not just what's beyond our experience of the outside world that's a mystery. For Kant, we actually only have access within our own souls to a phenomenal experience of ourselves. We appear to ourselves as thinking beings, but what's doing the thinking? What's behind the self-conscious stream of consciousness? And Kant would say, well, just as we can't know what's out there beyond our phenomenal experience, we can't know what's deep within ourselves. It's a mis we're a mystery even to ourselves. So I think of the theologian um, St. Augustine who said, uh, when asked, you know, where is God? And he, would, he replied that God is more intimate to my own experience than I am. So Kant, I think, is echoing this theological position that there's a mysterious God within and a mysterious God without. What science studies is this phenomenal realm, and science can continue to advance in its understanding of this phenomenal realm, but it will never be able to penetrate beyond that realm. He's limiting knowledge of nature to leave room for faith in things like human freedom, the immortality of the soul, and the existence of God. So this is 
You could call it the Kantian compromise. You could call it the Kantian interval because it doesn't last. It's an unstable compromise. Kant referred to his revolution in philosophy as a Copernican revolution because just as um, Kant led to this gestalt shift or the shift in perception where we realized that what we thought was a stationary earth and, and the heavens moving around was, was actually um, largely a product of the earth's motion. It's a figure ground shift. Kant was doing the same thing and saying that while we think we're getting knowledge of objects, we have objective knowledge of the world out there as it is in itself, he was reorienting um, our understanding of what knowledge is by putting the subject back at the center and saying our knowledge of objects depends on the structure of our subjectivity of our consciousness. And I ask if this is a Ptolemaic reaction in the sense that, you know, Ptolemy was the astronomer whose view of the universe, this geocentric view, was reigning in Europe uh, for 1,500 years, thereabouts. And Kant, responding to, Ka to Copernicus, who decentered the human, decentered the earth, Kant is trying to put us back at the center in a sense. Do you see how he's doing that? By saying that the structure of the human mind is what gives rise to the structure of nature and that what science calls nature is really an appearance constructed by our mind. Doesn't mean it's not law abiding. It doesn't mean if we wish for gravity to stop working that all of a sudden apples will, will float because it's, these are laws. They're laws of our mind though and we think they're laws of nature and science is when it's studying the natural world, experimenting upon it, what we're doing is, from the Kantian perspective, unveiling these unconscious laws that are operating in our own psyche, in our own soul. So that's Immanuel Kant. So there's these, these series of, of um, discoveries that disorient the modern mind, right? And this is Charles Darwin. So after Kant, he's the next major figure that I think helps us tell this next, the next character in the story of the emergence of science. And Darwin, of course, developed his theory of evolution that, like Copernicus, radically decentered the human being rather than being the special center of creation. All of a sudden, we see this multi-billion year history, four, three and a half to four billion year old history of an evolutionary process that's not, uh, human beings are not at the center. Human beings are off here on the edge somewhere. And this multi-billion year process of diversification and speciation has led to us, but we're not the end of it. This outer layer is all the diversity of life currently existing on the planet. You get a close up here. And these are the lineages, right? Going back to the origins, the first simple life forms, branching out into more and more complexity through bacteria, plants, fungi, all the animals. And you can see these lines here where there's a, a break in these lineages. These are mass extinction events. There have been five of them before the current mass extinction. There hasn't been an, once for 65 million years. The last one was probably caused by an asteroid. This one's caused by industrial civilization. So Darwin's picture of the origins of the human, very different than the biblical story that uh, Western people were used to. Not only are human beings um, an outgrowth of a multi-billion year process of evolution, which you know, we can speculate, and I will in a bit here, about what might be guiding that process, but there's also this, this inconvenient fact of extinction. Before Darwin, the idea of species going extinct uh, was not understood. The idea was that all species that currently existed were created by God uh, and that there's a stasis of species. And Darwin, uh, the accumulating fossil evidence and, and Darwin's brilliant theory of uh, natural selection allowed us to see, as well as geologists recognizing the strata of the earth and the age of the earth, allowed us to see this very different picture and so it makes human beings feel a bit more peripheral. And after Darwin came Freud, psychoanalysis. So not only did Copernicus decenter us cosmologically, Descartes and Kant kind of 
decentered us epistemologically and our understanding of knowledge. We don't have knowledge of things in themselves. We only have knowledge of the structure of our own mind. Then Darwin decenters us biologically. And then Freud comes along as if he, you know, we hadn't been kicked in the gut enough and says, uh, actually, the ego is not the master of its own house. So there's this whole subterranean realm of, of unconscious wishes and desires that we've inherited through this evolutionary process. And so even in our own consciousness, uh, according to the depth psychologists like, like Freud and Jung, Jung had a more spiritual angle than Freud, but they're still pointing to this sense in which the ego uh, is not really in charge of things. So we're radically decentered by these modern scientific discoveries. And that puts us at a crossroads. And given these scientific findings, there's one road that leads toward Whitehead's view, which I've called evolutionary panpsychism. I'll explain what that word panpsychism means in a second. The other road would be toward what's called eliminative materialism. So after Darwin and this recognition that the human being was not dropped in here on a parachute by a distant designer deity, but rather the human being emerged out of the earth as one of the species of this multi-billion year evolutionary process, how do we understand the nature of our human values, our freedom, our morality, our inner soul life. And the choice is to remain sort of philosophically consistent and coherent. Either we have to say, as eliminative materialists would say, that actually human consciousness is nothing but a, a brain excretion. It's ultimately reducible to the brain. And that humans, like the rest of the biosphere from this materialist perspective, are really, we're just machines. And, you know, it's not like these eliminative materialists, or at least some of them, want to say that we should all just become nihilists and hedonists and give up on law uh, and morality. And they'll hand wave trying to find other ways to establish and secure these values that we couldn't remain civilized social beings without. But it's either you reduce the human soul to a, to a mechanistic nature, or if human beings are a product of this evolutionary process and we have this consciousness, this depth of interiority, maybe the rest of nature has that depth of interiority, that soul life as well. Because we have to maintain continuity here, right? If human beings came out of this universe, either we deny our own soul life and say that's just an illusion and the whole thing's mechanical, including us, or we accept the panpsychist view, which is that soul does not just belong to human beings, that soul permeates the cosmos from beginning to end, from the smallest scale to the largest scale. And it's not that rocks are sitting around contemplating the nature of their existence and bemoaning the fact that they, they just, I'd love to be over in that river and I just can't get there. You know, there's a, there's a, a spectrum of consciousness, right? And Brian was kind of describing this for us. Rocks don't have complex sensory organs, but there's something from this panpsychist perspective, there's something it's like to be a rock. And if you would consider the earth over its four billion year, four and a half billion year geological history, and you were to speed that up to, you know, a 15 minute uh, movie, and you would see the molten lava and the churning of the early primeval earth and the solidification and uh, the condensation of water and the way that the tectonic plates are actually, it's like the earth is this giant self-healing wound, right? And you see these processes sped up to a kind of time frame that humans can grasp. Rocks, they start to look more like organisms, at least as a whole, as a planetary process, right? So th this is the crossroads. And I'm going to get to evolutionary panpsychism in a moment by, by unpacking some of Whitehead's ideas. But first, let's see what the eliminative materialists uh, are saying. Oh, well, this is a quote from Whitehead that lays out the stakes here, actually. So he says, a philosophic outlook is the very foundation of thought and of life. 
the sort of ideas we attend to and the sort of ideas which we push into the negligible background govern our hopes, our fears, our control of behavior. As we think, we live. As we think, we live. Remember that line as we discuss the eliminativists. This is why the assemblage of philosophic ideas is more than a specialist study. It molds our type of civilization. So I take philosophy seriously because I agree with Whitehead that as we think, we live. And this crossroads is, uh, I consider this to be philosophy in a time of emergency, right? It really matters which road we choose for the future of certainly human life, but life on this planet. So let's see what the eliminative materialist suggests. So often this conflict that's played up in the popular culture between science and religion, um, if you look at science the way it's portrayed as a replacement for religion, like we don't need religion anymore, now we have a scientific view, we have technology, we can just put our faith in the progress of science and technology, it becomes a religion. And the extreme is this school of thought called transhumanism. Uh, have you guys heard of transhumanism at all? So transhumanism um, is this idea really developed by this fellow, Ray Kurzweil, and he works for Google right now. And I believe his uh, research program is called the Immortality Project. So, you know, the scientifically minded will make fun of religious people who believe in the immortal soul. But, you know, this guy, Kurzweil, he's an atheist, materialist, but he's seeking another kind of immortality by creating a computer system that he hopes he could download his consciousness onto so as to live forever. So in my mind, this is a kind of surrogate religion, right? And so his view of what consciousness is is just kind of the software running on this biological hardware, and it could run on a different kind of hardware. And Kurzweil and the transhumanists are actually really into Pierre Teilhard de Chardin's idea of a singularity at the end of time. And they have just view the no-sphere, this spiritual envelope that Teilhard imagined that evolution is rushing towards. They just materialize that and say, oh, well, that's the internet. And we're getting to a point where computers are becoming fast enough that they can actually support our consciousness and we don't need our bodies anymore. We can just download our consciousness onto the internet and live forever in a digital form. So this is kind of what I imagine Kurzweil has in mind. Um, and, you know, there's this line from Tehard that I love about evolution. He says, the history of the living world can be reduced to the elaboration of ever more perfect eyes at the heart of a cosmos where it is always possible to discern more. I don't think this is what he had in mind. But the transhumanists read Tehard this way, and uh, Drew was pointing out that Tehard may have been a little too optimistic about the direction of technological evolution. So this is a philosopher uh, named Ray Brassier, and he is an eliminative materialist. He wrote a book called Nihil Unbound, Nihil from nihilism, this idea that there is no meaning. He wrote this book to really argue for a perspective that we'll introduce here. He says, curved space-time, the periodic table of elements, natural selection, none of these are comprehensible in narrative terms. Galaxies, molecules, and organisms are not for anything. Pretty depressing view. I don't agree with him, of course. Um, but he goes on. We'll, we'll, we'll hear him out. He says, the disenchantment of the world is a necessary consequence of the coruscating potency of reason, the brightness of reason, and hence an invigorating vector of intellectual discovery rather than a calamitous diminishment. Disenchantment deserves to be celebrated as an achievement of intellectual maturity, not bewailed as a debilitating impoverishment. Reality is indifferent to our existence and oblivious to the values and meanings which we would drape over it 
in order to make it more hospitable. Philosophy should be more than a sop to the pathetic twinge of human self-esteem. Thinking has interests that do not coincide with those of living. <sighs> Thinking has interests that do not coincide with those of living. This is a smart man. And he's interpreting the findings of modern science, this series of decenterings from Copernicus to Darwin and Freud. And he's saying, look, any meaning we find in this life of ours would be our own invention. And he's asking us to just get on board with this uh, exhilarating quest for scientific truth. And truth, as he imagines it, is totally independent of beauty, value, goodness. So this is a particular view of, of what modern science is. It's the eliminative materialist view. And Most scientists would accept that, that science is a method. It's a way of knowing, a way of, um, of um, coming to understand uh, the universe, but it's not a metaphysics. It's not a comprehensive uh, system that would explain all of, all of existence. And they, they recognize the limits of the scientific method, but Brassier wants to say it's not just a method, that science is materialism. And this puts us in a situation that uh, Richard Tarnas, another professor at, at the California Institute of Integral Studies, describes in, in the epilogue to the, his book, Passion of the Western Mind. It puts us in the situation of split consciousness, where on the one hand, we experience ourselves from within as free, moral beings capable of artistic creation, right? capable of empathy, building community, and yet science in this materialistic interpretation of it is telling us that there is no meaning and value in the universe. So uh, Rick Tarnas describes this situation. He says, our psychological and spiritual predispositions are absurdly at variance with the world revealed by our modern scientific method. We seem to receive two messages from our existential situation. On the one hand, strive, give oneself to the quest for meaning and spiritual fulfillment. But on the other hand, know that the universe of whose substance we are derived is entirely indifferent to that quest, soulless in character and nullifying in its effects. We are, we are at once aroused and crushed for inexplicably, absurdly, the cosmos is inhuman, yet we are not. The situation is profoundly unintelligible. This is the situation that Drew was describing earlier, being between stories. We don't have an integral view of the world which would allow us to take science seriously, but that wouldn't ask us at the same time to deny our experience as human beings, where we're capable of love, artistic creativity, free decisions, moral responsibility. How do these two hang together? Because the modern scientific perspective claims that it's still a kind of IOU, but the claim is that through only a few, maybe another decade of neuroscientific investigation, they will crack the consciousness code and reveal how this, uh, I don't know, what is it, 10 pounds? This piece of meat, less? Three pounds. Three pounds. <laughs> this three pound piece of meat is all that we are. How do we make meaning of our lives in this context? What would spirituality mean in this context? Let's give the neuroscientists, the, the materialistic neuroscientists, the benefit of the doubt for a second and think about what the process of death might amount to. Even if we are just our brains, try to imagine what it would mean for that brain to stop receiving oxygen, blood flow, 
the heart stops. Parts of the brain begin to shut down. People have experienced this process, come back, then resuscitated to recount it. And they all have pretty similar stories. You know, the tunnel of light and so on. And I think there's actually a passageway through this experience of death. And the ancient Greeks, Socrates, used to talk about when he was asked, you know, what is philosophy? He said, philosophy is learning to die. Philosophy is learning to die while still alive. They experience a kind, a kind of ego death. And it could very well be that ego consciousness is dependent on the brain. And when we die, the ego dies. But if the depth psychologists are right, there's more to us than our ego. This is a painting by um, Alex Gray. And so there are these esoteric uh, perspectives that elaborate what might happen at the moment of death. The Tibetan Buddhists have uh, their own uh, account, different bardos, they call them, different layers of the spiritual realms that um, we pass through after death. There's a, a Christian mystic named Rudolf Steiner who describes um, what happens after death as uh, a reversal, an experience of our whole lives up to that point in reverse from other people's perspectives, the people who knew us. Think about that as a, as a sort of, you know, rather than going up to heaven and being judged by God, looking at the book of all the things you've done. You don't experience it that way. Rather, this, what you could call judgment occurs by you reliving your life backwards from the perspective of others. So it's like all these other eyes are looking at you. You're experiencing yourself kind of from the outside. Think about how that might shape you morally while you're alive now if you, get, if you have to live through that experience upon dying. So we gave the materialists the benefit of the doubt. I think it could be that ego consciousness is limited to the brain, and when the brain and the body de decay, our identity transforms into something else. And maybe there's this process of kind of atonement and the burning off of our personal egoic consciousness as we ex re-experience our lives backwards from the perspective of others. And then where do we end up? It's a question we can explore. Let's explore now the, the, the panpsychist perspective. Yeah. Consciousness. Eliminative materialism as in, this isn't dualism, where there's matter, the physiology of our bodies, and then consciousness is this weird emergent thing, and we, it's mysterious, but you have to accept that it's part of the, the universe in some way. The, that, that would be more of a dualist position. And you could be, so there are these, these uh, subtle differentiations in, in different schools of thought. You could be an emergentist about consciousness and say it's an emergent property that can't be reduced to the brain, but that that emergent property of consciousness is, um, it's kind of like this uh, vapor that doesn't have any causal efficacy to control the body. So we just have the illusion of consciousness the eliminativists are saying we, we can actually, we're, we only think that we're conscious because of the language that we're used to speaking in. And in reality, w when our culture shifts and becomes more scientific, we won't talk about falling in love anymore. We'll talk about oxytocin uh, being released, right? And that art will be more a matter of manipulating certain regions in, in the occipital lobe, you know, visual art. So that our language will change and we won't talk about inner experience anymore or any of this. We'll talk in terms of neurochemicals and brain modules and so on. So it's a more extreme position. But I think it's at least consistent internally in the sense that it's not trying to have it both ways and say, yeah, consciousness is real, but matter and, and, and the body is all mechanical. It's like, it's a more consistent position, as radical as it is. 
So panpsychism then, this is Stephen Shaviro. He's a panpsychist who has popularized uh, some of Whitehead's ideas. And he says, it is only an anthropocentric prejudice to assume that things cannot be lively and active and mindful on their own without us. Eliminativist arguments thus start out by presupposing human exceptionalism. So what Shaviro and other panpsychists are doing is they're saying this idea that, you know, like Descartes thought that only the human being had a soul, only the human being is, is a rational, free thinking creature and everything else is devoid of thought, devoid of feeling. It's a very anthropocentric position and the alternative might be critiqued, you know, panpsychism might be critiqued as anthropomorphic, which is the idea that humans tend to project onto other species or mountains or the earth as a whole, what are really human qualities. We don't know if the rocks can feel. And, you know, some um, animal behaviorists will say we don't even know if other animals can feel, which there was recently this uh, paper signed by a bunch of scientists called the Cambridge Declaration on Consciousness, where finally you know, Descartes had said, when you experiment on a dog and it starts to, to whine, you know, when you're, you're doing an anatomy experiments, that's just like um, the squeaking of gears. You don't have to worry about the dog suffering, right? And scientists didn't forcefully reject that view until the Cambridge Declaration of Consciousness. And they're like, no, we have scientific evidence now that, you know, not only all mammals, but all creatures, maybe even plants, have this experiential capacity, you know, um, whether it's an octopus or a cuttlefish with a totally different kind of nervous system, we have evidence that they can experience pain, right? So they've started to correct this situation. But the risk, so there's this need to balance, right, between anthropocentrism that says only human beings have soul and anthropomorphism that just kind of recklessly projects soul everywhere. And what Shaviro is, is suggesting is that we've gone a little bit too far in the direction of criticizing anthropomorphism, which makes us more anthropocentric. And we need to balance this, the scales a bit and recognize that maybe it's not human experience as complex as our own interiority is that is present um, in an amoeba, but some kind of experience is. So, there are a lot of critiques of, of the, the West as being too anthropocentric, of being um, disenchanting and, and de demeaning of the natural world. Um, but there's also this, this heterodox uh, tradition, this lineage of thinkers that goes back all the way to the ancient Greeks that brings forth, that, that uh, carries forward an alternative view of the universe that we don't often hear when we uh, get here the story of, of the development of Western thought. So I'm just going to run through. This is not an exhaust, exhaustive list by any means, but um, that's Thales of Miletus, often said to be the first philosopher. He believed um, that the whole universe was water, but water that had a kind of interior soul dimension to it. And he said that the universe is full of gods. They're not separate from this world. They're part of this world. So he's a panpsychist. Her Heraclitus another panpsychist who's a process philosopher as well. For, for Heraclitus, all things flow, whether we're talking about our inner mental experience, our stream of consciousness, or whether we're talking about uh, the physical universe. All things flow for Heraclitus. This is Giordano Bruno, who you may know from, I would call it the scientific mythology, where he was burnt at the stake for his scientific views when really, if you, if you look more closely at the history, yeah, he was a Copernican. He believed in the heliocentric hypothesis. But he was also a practicing magician. He was uh, also conspiring with Henry of Navarros, who became the king of France, who was in conflict with the Catholic Church and the Pope for control of the, the future of Christianity in Europe. A lot of religious wars going on and intolerance. You know, the Protestant Reformation is is unfolding, and um, the Catholic Church was really threatened by people like King Henry of Navarros, who wanted to create religious freedom and say, Protestant, Catholic, doesn't matter, we can all live together. And 
Bruno was, was very much uh, a sort of co-conspirator. And so when the Catholic Church got a hold of him and started uh, asking him questions, they were more concerned about his political activities than his strange scientific ideas. So to say that he was a martyr for science and burnt at the stake for his belief in the scientific perspective is not exactly accurate. That's Baruch Spinoza, a Jewish pantheist who saw God and nature as one. It's another way of thinking of what panpsychism is. That whether we talk about the natural world or we talk about God, what we're really talking about is the same infinite system, right? Whitehead's a little different than, than Spinoza. He's, he's not a pantheist. He still wants to distinguish between God and the world even while they're totally interdependent. We'll get to that. That is Gottfried Leibniz, who co-discovered calculus with Newton and had a view of the world of, um, uh, made up as made up of infinitely many monads, he called them, which were, um, it's kind of a holographic universe. Each monad, and these, he imagined them to be microscopic, each monad was uh, a microcosm of the whole universe in itself. In that at the beginning of time, God created a pre-established harmony between all these monads. And so Leibniz tried to have it both ways, that you know, God's omniscient and omnipotent sets this whole monadic universe into motion. Uh, and of course, God knows what's going to happen in advance, but each monad, from its you know, finite perspective, doesn't know what's going to happen. So Leibniz tried to preserve freedom in that way. But he, he thought that soul was everywhere. There are plant souls. There's souls in what appear to be merely physical processes, different kinds, different levels of soul, right? That's uh, Schopenhauer, who was one of the earliest Europeans to be exposed to Buddhism, had this view of uh, the world as this process of um, unconscious will gradually becoming more conscious of itself, and that, you know, that the formation of, um, of stars and, and solar systems uh, was an expression of this unconscious will, another form of panpsychism. This is Friedrich Schelling. Uh, this is, I'm going to speed up here. Um, this is um, Ernst Haeckel, who popularized and, and further Darwin's ideas of evolution, but had a more organic panpsychist view of the evolutionary process. That's uh, Fechner, Bergson, William James, Teilhard de Chardin, these are contemporary panpsychists. That's Galen Strawson. That's David Skirbina, Freya Matthews, Christoph Koch, a neuroscientist who was a materialist, but in studying the brain, he recognized this is a really hard problem. And actually, we can't solve it if we're just going to try to reduce consciousness to the brain. So he ended up accepting panpsychism. That's uh, Rupert Sheldrake. That's Isabel Stengers. This is Graham Harmon. So these are all contemporary figures. Panpsychism is alive and well in contemporary academic philosophy. It's really amazing. Since I started my dissertation, um, I finished in 2016, started in 2010. In 2010, the standard line from a um, famous philosopher named Colin McGinn was that he said, there's something kind of stoned about panpsychism or kind of hippie-ish. Uh, you know, so it's just easy to dismiss it, dismiss it as absurd, right? And it, actually, I think he has a point. It's easier to grasp panpsychism if you add a little puff, actually. Because um, it alters our consciousness and gets us out of the egoic perspective, which lends itself to thinking that, you know, we're special. We can start to contact these other dimensions of consciousness. Um, but now, all these books are being published and journals special editions of journals, exploring panpsychism as a real possibility to get us beyond what's called the hard problem of consciousness, which is how the brain and the mind are related. So that's encouraging. Okay, Whitehead. Is it 3 o'clock already? All right. We're going to do a crash course in Whitehead. So remember he said, as we think, we live. It's very different from the eliminativist perspective that says thought has interests contrary to life. For Whitehead, thought is an expression of life. And he says, here he's going against 
the modern dichotomy between facts and values and saying that we have no right to deface the value experience, which is the very essence of the universe. Existence, in its own nature, is the upholding of value intensity. So value is not something that human beings project onto the world from Whitehead's panpsychist perspective. Value is something human beings learned from the universe. That we are an evolutionary result of the values intrinsic to existence itself. That's his, that's his point of view. And he has an elaborate uh, philosophical argument for getting us to this place, and we don't have time to go through that right now. But this is, this is another of, of his claims, that the key notion from which the construction of a cosmology should start is that the energetic activity considered in physics is the emotional intensity entertained in life. So, yes. Do you find it safe to equate the relativist model with the, the Buddhist nature of samsara or the illusion of suffering? There's a way, there's a root. I have a good friend actually who's a Tibetan, uh, he's not Tibetan, he's a Buddhist practitioner in the Tibetan tradition uh, who thinks that eliminativism from his perspective as a Buddhist practitioner is just fine with him because from the, you know, the Buddhists, the Buddhist spirituality is more concerned with eliminating suffering than it is with figuring out the nature of existence, right? So it doesn't matter from their perspective. Um, Tibetan Buddhism does have an elaborate cosmology, which I would say is more panpsychist than eliminativist, but ultimately it doesn't matter from the perspective of seeking enlightenment and the cessation of suffering. On the other hand, I would say that um, we're more likely to enjoy our existence more if we live out a philosophical perspective that is recognizing soul all around us. That's my wager. So the idea here is that what we experience as emotion in ourselves is a complex version of what, a more complex version of what physicists study when they study energy. And that what energy ultimately is, seen from another perspective, is a vector of feeling, right? Energy always moves in a certain direction. And from Whitehead's perspective, we shouldn't ignore the fact that the motion of energy is analogous to the emotion of the soul. And, you know, one way to think about this is when you, you know, you walk into a room sometimes and a mood falls over you. And you could say that's your nervous system just interpreting the physical structure of the room, but you could also think of it as if there's a certain energy in that room. And that energy folds itself into your experience and characterizes your interior perspective on things. And so that there's a continuity between the physical energy studied by physics and the psychological emotion that we experience. So Whitehead wants to describe a universe wherein the wavelengths of light emanating from the sun can hang together with the experience of redness and orange, and the, the, the beautiful colors of the sunset. That it's, from Whitehead's perspective, we don't want to discount or try to explain away the experience of the beauty of the sunset, and the colors, the radiance. That's as real as the wavelengths of light studied by the physicists. So he wants a universe, a cosmology, wherein these two things hang together. He's not denying the physical perspective. He's saying yes and we're seeing that same physical process as beautiful. And that the beauty is real. Would you find that to be the same as the Buddhist concept of the feather light? Perceiving the universe in the I would. 
Yeah, there's a quote at the end here that I think will maybe bring that home a bit. Um, so here, reiterating a similar point, neither physical nature nor life can be understood unless we fuse them together as essential factors in the composition of really real things whose interconnections and individual characters constitute the universe. So this is a, a radical move. He says, biology then, what follows from this last uh, quote, is that biology is the study of the larger organisms, whereas physics is the study of the smaller organisms. So Whitehead describes um, atoms, protons and neutrons uh, that compose atoms as they used to be free living or uh, they used to be autonomous, protons and neutrons, at the very early stage of the universe. And he describes the process whereby, just like in the biological world, when you had um, prokaryotic cells, which were very simple cells, they, ke they became eukaryotic cells, which were the building blocks of animals, through a process of what's called symbiogenesis, where formerly free-living cells, like mitochondria, which used to exist independently, were eaten by this other cell, but not digested. And then, then in the next reproductive cycle, the mitochondria was reproduced inside of the next generation of cells. So a new life form is brought forth through this process of symbiosis because they created, uh, they had a, entered a mutually enha enhancing relationship. Whitehead describes as analogous to this, protons and neutrons finding each other and recognizing that their capacity to endure was in enhanced by this relationship, by this symbiosis. They brought forth, you know, one uh, proton and one neutron, with the help of an electron, brought forth a new species of organism, hydrogen. And then the evolutionary process continues, where hydrogen atoms assemble together into stars. A new species of organism is born. So Whitehead says, really, the most fundamental science that we have is ecology, which describes these evolving relationships among organisms. So rather than a certain sort of physics, reductionistic physics, being the foundational science where all the other sciences are reducible to it, Whitehead puts ecology at the basis of the scientific view of the universe and says that the evolution, the co-evolution of organisms from the subatomic level to the biological world that we know here on Earth. It's an evolutionary process. So rather than inert atoms as the building blocks of his universe, Whitehead talks about occasions of experience, where the simplest occasion of experience would be a photon or an electron, a flash of awareness that's not self-conscious, but it's very difficult to imagine what this might be like, but it allows for this continuity where up, up the scale of complexity, consciousness is complexified and the interiority is deepened. So he says that these unities of existence, these occasions of experience are the really real things which in their collective unity compose the evolving universe, ever plunging in the, into the creative advance process. So he's, he says the problem of evolution is the development of enduring harmonies, of enduring shapes of value. A hydrogen atom, a eukaryotic cell, a blue whale, a human being, enduring shapes of value achieved in the evolutionary process. And these enduring shapes merge into higher attainments of things beyond themselves. He says, aesthetic attainment is interwoven in the texture of realization. Whoa, aesthetics, right? Beauty is an intrinsic part of the evolutionary process. And he is saying there is a teleology to this process. And that's something that he can't really logically prove, but he thinks it's consistent with what we've observed in our universe. He thinks it's consistent with the order that has arisen in the course of this universe. He's not denying entropy, and I'm sure we're going to talk about this. <laughs> he's not denying destruction and chaos, but he's saying there's some kind of allure towards beauty that's driving the evolutionary process. And this is where his 
theology comes in. This is a long one, but this is, this is one of my favorite paragraphs in Whitehead's thought. He says, there is a unity in the universe enjoying value and by its imminence sharing value. For example, take the subtle beauty of a flower in some isolated glade of a primeval forest. No animal has ever had the subtlety of experience to enjoy its full beauty. And yet, this beauty is a grand fact in the universe. When we survey nature and think, however flitting and superficial has been the animal enjoyment of its wonders, and when we realize how incapable the separate cells and pulsations of each flower are of enjoying the total effect, then our sense of the value of the details for the totality dawns upon our consciousness. That is the intuition of holiness, the intuition of the sacred, which is at the foundation of all religion. So Pat, earlier you were talking about the whole in each of the parts as one way of thinking about how the divine participates in this universe. That's what Whitehead's pointing to when he talks about the unity of the universe. For him, God is the soul of the world. God is the unity that allows the universe to hang together. Whitehead's God is not an omnipotent, omniscient, uh, creator deity who stands above the world and designed it from the outside. Whitehead's God is bound up in the process of evolution. Whitehead's God is, as Whitehead describes it, a fellow sufferer who understands. God experiences all of the suffering of life. God also experiences all of the joy of life. And Whitehead will say that the power that God has depends upon the love that God inspires. So from Whitehead's process theological perspective, he's inviting us into what, what I would call, oh, there's our flower, what I would call a participatory form of spirituality. That, you know, if someone were to ask me, do you believe in God? That's a tough question for me to answer because belief implies this view of a God that exists independently of what I, uh, how I live my life. And the Whiteheadian view, this participatory view, is saying that if, if God exists, God's only way of um, changing what happens is through my hands, through your hands, through our love for one another. That God's not somewhere else, some, something that we might need to believe in because we don't have experience of it here and now. God, Whitehead says, is with us and among us or nowhere. It's a radically incarnational view of the divine, I would say. And it's participatory in the sense that it's calling us to become, I want to say this in a humble way, but to become divine with God. And God needs us to become divine as well. Very different kind of theology when you say that God needs us. So I think that opens a whole new set of questions and potential practices as a spiritual path that we might explore where religion has to accept the spirit of change in the same way that science does. This is a radically different view of the divine but it welcomes us into a sort of existence that allows us to feel at home at the same time that it calls us to become responsible for our effects on the planet and even responsible uh, for God's experience, God's joy and God's suffering with us. So I think I'll leave it at that, and, uh, and I want to have a great conversation with you guys. So let's let's do it, and and Pat uh, as well. If you have an initial uh, inquiry, we could dive into, or we can hear from anyone. If you could just record that or write down that last part, and I'll just preach that every. Time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. David. If you punctuate 
that last statement a little differently. God needs us to become divine. Yeah. yeah. So it's yeah. two two way. I like that. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. That was really great. Thanks, David. I would say a little bit different. God needs us to realize our own divinity that in fact we already are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure. I think Doug behind you there. Uh, one thing I meditate on is uh, the, the concept of homeostasis, you know, just finding that balance in health, you know, we become conscious of that as systems start to break down. Um, and, and the thing that's coming to mind now is, is an, ecolo an ecological homeostasis as well, you know, finding yourself in balance with, with the ecology. Mm -hmm. Well, that's an interesting point. Um, you know, often I think this perspective was kind of um, emphasized by the deep ecologists who had wonderful things to teach us, but this idea of nature as a harmony, as a homeostatic system, doesn't really do justice to the extent to which um, nature has been full of catastrophe, uh, radical disequilibrium. Um, if you want to call it anything, it might be closer to homeodynamic, which makes the dynamic instead of the static part. It's clearly there's a homeo, like uh, uh, an attempt to maintain balance, but it's not static. It wobbles. You know, if you look at the history of the temperature on the planet from the ice core samples and other, other forms of uh, research, you know, this isn't the first climate change episode that we're witnessing today. This isn't the first mass extinction. So, you know, um, White, the the panpsychist view of the universe is not just saying that nature is this beautiful, harmonious system, and if only human beings would just stop messing around with it, we could get back into harmony. Nature is, um, the creativity of nature is destructive at the same time that it's creative. And so it's more about human beings kind of not being in such denial of death accepting that life is a cycle, right? And that we can't predict what's coming next and we can't try to micromanage and control everything. But, you know, the wild, if you want, is, is it's truly wild. So it's homeodynamic. I just slightly twist your word a little bit there. Cool. Can I change my last statement? Yeah. Uh-huh, right. I like that. Nice. Who's next? <coughs> Here you go, Tootie. If indeed we are God, we're all the molecules and we are everything. Down in the trenches, where we get our best lessons from the <laughs> turkeys in our life, as I like to put it, um, the people that are difficult sometimes teach us our best lessons. Uh, when we have something difficult, we're challenged to think about it, to pray about it, or to meditate, or hike, or whatever it is you do when you do it. But it also connects us with what all of each of you have been telling us about the, the ecology of our accountability or our accountability in the ecology issues, in the issues of the divine, in the issues of how do I live on the planet? What do I do? Some of what each of you have said, what am I going to do today? What am I going to do tomorrow? What can I do? And you guys are big thinkers and making huge differences in the world. But some of us are small. Some of us are old. <laughs> you know, what am I going to do? Because I'm charged. If I wasn't before I got here, I 
sure as hell am now. I deal with what I can deal with in my world. No willful ignorance. I become as aware as I can be. I notice what's around me. And if I notice it, it's mine. And I accept it. And then I question, like each of you has ex talked about, what is my rise? What, what means something to me? And how does that translate into how I can express that with and for others? Because even the worst of those turkeys is still God, is still me, is still spirit, is still a part of the creation that I am. And I don't want to identify with those folks. But if I don't, then I'm part of the problem, and I'm part of the polarization, and I'm part of the dichotomy. And I refuse to be that and do that. And having been hopeless, and stymied. So many of us are, are by what's going on um, on a day to day basis and nationally and in the world. What you've given us in these last days, it's even more than hope. Golly, my shoulders went back and I stood up straight. <laughs> I can do something about it. It's small. But we're talking about atoms, we're talking about neutrons, we're talking about the infinitesimal components of infinity. Hmm. I can't thank you enough for the gifts you've given us, each of you. But we also have a plan of action. Hmm. We've all got to get out there and do something. And each of us will do it differently. And each of us is going to have their own interpretation of what to do. And that just makes it beautifully diverse, in my opinion. Mm. Well, thank you, Tootie. You know, mouths need ears, so thank you for hearing me. Um, I want to thank you for the excellent overview of the evolution of human thought. Um, that was really awesome. Uh, I can't keep it all in my mind at once. Uh -huh. um, and I'm, I'm glad I don't have to summarize <laughs> as a participant um, all of those things. I do want to say um, that you know, what can I do is a question. Uh, it's, yeah this participatory spirituality thing. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, I want to tell you what happened to me that helped me uh, come through a lot of confusion. Um, I had cancer diagnosed about two years ago. And it was widespread all over my body. It was stage four uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. I had six months of chemotherapy, and um, <laughs> um, I pulled up my bootstraps, and uh, I, I thought that, yeah, you know, I can conquer this. I'm, I'm more than this. And so I exercised and mountain biked. And I came through the chemotherapy without much damage. And I had no recurrence at that time. But then they suggested that I have a bone marrow transplant to enhance my longevity, which I did. I laid in bed after the transplant for one month. The only time I could get out of bed was when I had six episodes of diarrhea per day. My butt was red. <laughs> that is the only thing I could feel. Um, during that one month, I could not think a thought. 
because every thought was painful. I could not feel anything because every feeling was painful. Um, there's a word called anhedonia, which means the inability to feel pleasure. There was no pleasure. I couldn't watch Netflix. I couldn't listen to music. I couldn't think bad thoughts or good thoughts. I had to think no thoughts. The only way to take away the pain was to have no thoughts at all. So I learned how to stare at a blank wall and become the blank wall. My mind was a tabula rasa, a blank slate. The first and only enduring experience I had after coming out of that, the first thing that didn't cause me any pain, and the thing I hold on to now, were acts of kindness. That's what arose from that blank slate. Mm. When I could see an act of kindness, it was the first thing that didn't bother me. For me, that's enduring, and that's what I'm supposed to do mm. as often as I can. Now, it doesn't mean that I'm enlightened. <laughs> I, uh, I did save a moth yesterday, and I, I did save a honeybee, and put them outside, but I also killed 200 flies, <laughs> you know. But what it does mean is that I am aware today that kindness gives me meaning as a human. And that's as complicated as I'm going to make it. That's, that's all I got. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. This is very rich. Yeah. I will say that, you know, we you mentioned, somebody mentioned, it was you, <laughs> Drew mentioned uh, compassion and uh, agape as a New Testament word and hesed as an Old Testament word. And the basic translation of hesed is simply kindness. And agape is a self giving love. Hmm. Uh, um. If you guys want, we have a little bit of time, I can um, unpack a few more of the details of Whitehead's theology so you can get a fuller picture into that idea. Yeah. <coughs> so, We've got a oh question. sure, okay. I'll hold off on that for a second. Um, yesterday and today, what I've thought about a lot is the disconnectedness. I mean, what it's been pointed out between humans and the universe around us. And I consider the impact of that disconnection on the increase that we see in hatred and divisive conduct between humans as maybe a a part of that disconnection from the universe. And I wonder, and this may be sort of off the path a little bit, but I see technology as having a terrible potential for increasing that disconnection. And I kind of wonder what the thinking is around that potential. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, in, in our philosophy program back in San Francisco, we, we think about the evolution of consciousness. And it's not that consciousness evolves independently uh, in the human context, independently of technology. And if you look back at the history of our species, the stages of consciousness that we can detect correlate with new forms of communication technology. So the first technology, per, a communication technology, I would call it, it also helped us cook food, but fire allowed us to stay up at night as, as a group 
and um, perform these rituals of, of connection to the universe. Drums, the first speech, song, rhythm, the first communication um, uh, media technology, I would describe it as, right? Then we got to writing and script, right? And then we got the alphabet. Then we got print, print, the printing press. Um, you know, and when we just had script, that's when the first myths, you know, myths were told by oral cultures, and they got codified and written down, and that became religion. And then in the, with, with the birth of the printing press in the 1500s, uh, you started to get the Protestant Reformation because the Bible was now available and it was translated not out of Latin into the vernacular of various regions of Europe. And then you got democracy as a result of print literacy as more people were able to read because the alphabet and print technology made it more available. You get the Enlightenment. You get the French Revolution, the American Revolution. And then radio new kind of consciousness. Radio enabled um, a new kind of a sense of national unity where everyone was hearing the same thing at the same time. Uh, Nazi Germany took that one and ran with it. And then in the 60s, uh, you know, television had been around for a while, but we got like color television and the ability to carry cameras that were smaller anywhere in the world and the first images of war being deemed back, you know, the Vietnam War. And those images helped to spur the... the uh, anti-war movement and this more kind of postmodern consciousness was born as different cultures were encountering one another in our television programming and and then the internet which the internet is described as um, this communication technology that includes all the ones that came before it you can't have the internet without the alphabet uh, without TV radio like these are all included now in the internet and the idea initially when the internet was first being developed was that it would create, you know, Marshall McLuhan, the great media theorist, thought it would develop a global, we would develop into a global village. And unfortunately, at least at this point, we fractured into tribes um, and social media uh, seemed to function. Movements use them to organize, but social media has also been used to divide us. Uh, and we each, rather than with broadcast media where you've got a few news stations that sort of are the gatekeepers of truth, on the internet, everyone seeks out the website or websites that confirm their own worldview to them. And this is a problem across the political spectrum. Um, so what's the next communication medium? I'm not sure, but we're certainly um, wed to our technologies, and I don't like to think of human consciousness as somehow separate from technology. We, we're always going to be uh, entangled in this way. If we want to re-embed into nature, what I'm concerned about is that people are just embedding into a device. Mm. It's not the same to yeah. really explore and feel the energy of the earth and to look at a picture. <laughs> We've certainly gone too far in that direction. And it's funny that uh, there's an article, I think, in the New York Times a few years ago about how um, uh, tech workers in Silicon Valley that are developing Facebook and Twitter and these social media networks that they've designed to be addictive and get, give us a dopamine squirt every time someone likes our post, they recognize the danger of these things. They don't want their kids to have these smartphones and tablets. They're sending their kids to Waldorf schools where they don't even let plastic in the door. <laughs> um, you know, so there's this pushback coming, starting from the inside, the people developing these technologies. And my hope is that we'll recognize that we've gone too far. And it's not that you just need to get rid of the technologies, but, you know, maybe we can not be so addicted uh, to them. Well, I just wonder if there's been any um, look at the increase in individual embedding into technology and increase in yeah alienation hatred, depression ha yeah hatred. bad conduct around the world uh -huh. between humans anyway just just a thought this mm -hmm. has been a, a great program thank it's you it's an important question thanks we've got a couple more 
Um, just in response, there's one good news that we're not killing each other as much as last century. So war is really down compared to two world wars and the Cold War. <laughs> so something is not letting us kill each other like before because it's probably the last world war we'll have. Or maybe we're trading more. Well, anyway, a little bit of hope. <laughs> and, oh, what else? Oh, and in my view, we've had all these technologies throughout history, but maybe psychologically we're just as tribal as we were as hunter-gatherers, and we fight each other for our territory, for resources, and we're just as good as evil as we have always been. So that's mm. probably it. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Dennis. Yeah. I could do this privately, Kirk, but I'm going to broadcast it. I was attracted to you right off, and now I know another reason. I experienced a whole lot of radiation and a little chemo a while back, quite a while back, about four years, and I'm still suffering effects. I've had a recent injury that is uh, very disturbing in not only physical but mental, a mental way, and I, I get very tired very easily. And I want to thank you for your encouragement, first of all, for treating my pessimism kindly and for encouraging me to go on and realize there are so many people that have had it so much rougher than I have and that I don't need to feel sorry for myself. I need to persist and Be kind and grateful. Thanks, Dennis. Yeah. Skip, yeah. And Skip, you want to? <laughs> there were just all kinds of, of thoughts going through my head uh, just a second ago, and um, some of them were uh, coming together in a group like this and thinking back on my own life. There was a time period when um, I was a uh, river guide and uh, raft guide, et cetera, back in North Carolina, this little place right outside of Bryson City. And I lived in the woods, and I took tourists up and down the river, and I taught kayaking. And then I would leave there and drive across the country, and I'd end up living up in the woods above uh, Durango and working at the ski area and skiing. And it was even before Durango had the mall. And then I ended up in... Uh, Florida, staying at home once, and I start looking and I go, those are a lot, there are a lot of pretty cool looking stores around, you know? So I started going in these stores and there's a lot of neat shit on the walls and there's just marketing going on. And, and, and then, you know, I'm looking like, at first I'm going like, I really have no use for it. And then pretty soon I'm going like, man, I'd like to have that. And then I started looking at price tags, and I go, I'm really poor. I am dirt poor. I can't afford any of this stuff. Let me get back to the woods. So my point being is that our perspective a lot of times, I mean, we can hide. I think a lot of people, a lot of times people tend to go, oh, I live in Telluride. Look at the beauty. Don't read the paper. Don't look at the Internet. Don't look at all this. And but there's stuff going on. Or if you live in Telluride, let's say, and then you go into the middle of New York City and you go like, well, God, we can't even solve affordable housing in Telluride. Look at this city. I mean, it's just, how are, they gonna, how are we going to ever solve anything? So what I'm just saying is that we come from different perspectives. What we've opened up to here, uh, Matt, with you and John and... Um, 
Drew, I wanted to, almost wanted to say <laughs> Bart or whatever it was before. <laughs> Drew, uh, you've opened up a, a lot of thinking that I have, I mean, I want to go back to college again. I think. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's like, yeah, it's just, it's just absolutely <laughs> amazing. But that leads into what the, what the two gentlemen are talking about here. You know, we look, we're on the internet. We, you know, we live in homes now and a lot of times, I live in Los, I've lived around people for 15, 16 years in Telluride. I have to admit, I, there's a lot of my neighbors I don't know. Mm. And what Pat does here, you know, I've been to a few, a few present th um, seminars that he set up here, getting community together and getting people together and being able to say to complete strangers, you know, hey man, I was attracted to you right off the bat. <laughs> I was too. You got you got that look. You, you know, you got that happy look about you. But anyway, you know, for us to sit in a group of people in a room and not hundreds of people, but thirty or forty people, this is showing I showing me what our society is really missing because there's a lot of very very intelligent, smart people in this room. And thanks to Pat and. Teresa here for putting these things together and you guys taking your time and uh, yeah. showing us stuff we've, you know, you can only imagine. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. may, I've got a lot of notes, so I hope I have time to follow, up, follow through on them all, but thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. All I the mean, work you guys have done. If, if anyone good. is feeling, um, you know, their interest was, was piqued by something I said, you know, feel free to email me or check out this website. Uh, my blog, I can, I always love to be in dialogue, so don't be shy if you want to continue the conversation. Uh, I, yeah. s since we're sharing uh, s stories and this, uh, the narrative, the uber narrative here is about storytelling, yeah. um, I want to share a story of how I came to Whitehead. Um, I had sort of um, an existential crisis um, back when I lived in the Chicago suburbs and maybe even before that, but I probably didn't know that's what it was. Um, I had trouble believing in um, an omnipotent, in other words, an all-powerful, um, or an omniscient, in other words, all-knowing deity or God figure. There are lots of things about um, exoteric or the superficial Christianity um, that I had trouble with, and omniscience and omnipotence were two big ones. And I happened to be at a um, cocktail party thing um, and was talking to a theologian. And he said, you've got to study Whitehead. You've just got to, you've got to read Whitehead. And that was the beginning of it. And that was maybe, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago. Um, but I just offer that to you because sometimes people feel alienated from religion. Um, they, they know they're a spiritual being in a physical body, but they feel alienated from what they perceive they're being offered um, uh, in religion. And for me, not necessarily for you, but for me, Whitehead was a path to, to a, a, a bigger perspective uh, in Brian Swim's uh, a cosmological consciousness about divinity, um, a bigger capacity for, for feeling into divinity. Uh, because Whitehead is not about being omnipotent and not about being omniscient. And in fact, it's, he, he describes a divine lure of love, which Matt, Matt talked about. And to me, that was the only thing that made sense as divinity. So I, oh, um, probably one of, uh, it was probably one of John Cobb's books. Uh, John Cobb, C-O-B-B. Mm. Um, he's a process, well, well-known process theologian out of Claremont, California, uh, where uh, their theology school has um, embraced process theology. So John Cobb has a lot of a lot of material, and there's and there's a great uh, website. I think it's called uh, Process and Faith or Faith and Process. One of the two. Can't remember which order that is, uh, but Google that, and that's there's a wealth of information there. Um. In case people are curious about where to start with Whitehead, yeah, John Cobb uh, would be a great... From a theological from perspective. From a theological perspective. Yeah. David Ray Griffin is another process theologian. And if you want to jump into Whitehead, um, some of his books are really difficult to, to penetrate. Um, okay, that's an understatement. They're really, 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 really difficult. Really, 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 really difficult. Um, 
Griffin is very readable. Um, but there's this book that Wright, Whitehead wrote in 1927, I believe, called Religion in the Making. And it's, it's his philosophy of religion. And it's very um, digestible. Um, there are certain paragraphs that you might struggle with, but it's worth the struggle. But for the most part, he's telling a story of his view of religion in the context of cosmology. Um, you know, so he's defining religion. He's showing the evolution of religion through ritual, belief to a rational critique of religion and so on. And then there's actually a whole, well, the final chapter, or this middle chapter here, body and spirit. In these, uh, what, 25, 27 pages or so, it's a summary of his whole philosophical perspective as well. And it's written in a way that I think you can, you know, understand. Um, so religion in the making might be a good place to start if you want a primary text. Uh, to read, so I'll just I'll offer that. <coughs> that's a that's great. Thanks, Matt. Yeah. Other are there comments or breaks or Susan? We yeah oh. yeah. Um, I'm a new, newer student to metaphysics, and uh, it's been a passion of mine for many many years. But I really didn't know that it was the, the term metaphysics. There are so many ways that it's taught or yeah. for, at any rate I came across a term in uh, one of my chapters of study a couple of weeks ago but it didn't really explain the word it just the, I said evolutionary thought perfection hmm. and I just wondered if you had anything to share on evolutionary thought perfection hmm. I just took it as obviously as you say our thoughts our, our futures and our thoughts, mm. everything we everything we think is creating tomorrow. What we're thinking today is creating tomorrow. Right. And evolutionary thought perfection as a way to improve our lives and to improve the lives of others. Mm. You ever heard the term? And that, I was hoping I haven't heard share. that exact term, but I'll s I can reflect on that idea. Um, you know, in the context of a cosmology like Whitehead like Whitehead's, um, he's a process thinker, and evolution is described by him as this open-ended, he calls it a creative advance. Um, you can think of it as a journey. And there's never a point where we reach perfection. Um, and so I would want to try to keep it open-ended. Certainly there's a process of of um, deepening and complexification and intensification such that we can experience uh, a depth of beauty that we couldn't before. For Whitehead, beauty is when you take what would be conflicting um, principles or you know colors if you're talking about a painting or sounds if you're talking about music. You take these conflicting um, uh, principles and you find a way to change them into contrasts that then become part of some new harmonious whole. And whenever a, a harmony is achieved, because the nature of the universe is creative evolution, it's gonna be disturbed by some novel element that sticks its head in there and disturbs what had been achieved. But that's what keeps the evolutionary journey going. And that's what keeps um, this process of intensification from um, you know, solidifying and getting stuck static right so you know perfection isn't isn't something that you know Whitehead would say that evolution is moving toward if if we imagine it as an end point Whitehead's view of evolution is very much open-ended yeah yeah Doug in the back I think it's important to overlay on uh, that Marshall McLuhan idea of the evolution of uh, the technologies of communication to the nature of the one-to-one the -one interaction, the face-to-face -face interaction that's happening, um, or the person-to-person -person interaction that's now happening on the internet. Mm, yeah. um, you know, Christianity spread very quickly because of the Roman road system. Uh -huh. um, you know, that, that Christ consciousness that was born out of the, the Jewish resistance to the Roman rule 
spread like wildfire like they wouldn't believe, like they couldn't believe mm -hmm. because of that, that trade system that right. they had built right. and, and how that, that all connects. Um, and I think it's you know, the, the quality of that one-to-one -one, um, transmission of that belief, you know, the oral transmission of that belief, I think mm -hmm. is, is crucial as well as the technology. Yeah. You know, from the one-to-one -one around the fire to one to round around the internet and yeah. what we are right now, you know, that's what we are. Yeah, and I've seen this play out in my own life where um, someone who, when I engage with comments on Facebook or Twitter, arguing about whatever, and then we finally decided, hey, let's, let's, let's talk via video conference and like work this out face to face, mediated by technology, but it, it was a very different, uh, the arc of the conversation was very different than how it played out um, on social media. So this notion of, you know, there's a, there's a Jewish theologian, uh, Martin Buber, used to talk about the difference between an I-it relationship, which isn't really a relationship, and an I-thou or an I-you relationship, and that, you know, we degrade um, the human spirit when we treat others as objects, as its, um, and so we should always engage other humans as though there was another I behind their face, just like my I. So that's an I-you relationship. But we can also engage the natural world on that personal level by recognizing the consciousness of other non-human uh, beings. So yeah, that um, meeting of of face to face, and some some you know trees don't have faces, but I think we can also encounter a tree in this way as well. It's, yeah, so important. That's, that's the, um, that's where the spirituality happens. Mm -hmm. That's a good segue. Pat, do you want to mention the, that's part of your hike tomorrow? Yes. Um, so uh, the exercise is one of <clears throat> experiencing nature from different perspectives. And uh, the different perspectives are that I, it, the I thou, which is a we, and the I I, which is as ourselves. And so we begin with the I it, and um, it's very in the head. <laughs> um, you know, looking objectively at, uh, at nature, um, noticing the separations. Um, then the I thou is very much a um, relational um, experience of nature. And yeah, if you ever talk to a tree or a rock or a, or a, or a meadow or a river, <laughs> try it, it's great. Um, we can have a, a relational sense of that and that's much more of an emotional kind of uh, experience of nature. But the I, I is also um, realizing ourselves or, or the, the boundaries then between ourselves and nature becoming um, more and more sheer, um, less, more and more transparent. Uh, to where we begin to realize or to exp or have the uh, invitation to experience nature is in fact um, um, us, um, the whole um, and each part, in fact, is sharing something of our own existence and reality and identity. So that's what that's about. And I invite you to just again, uh, um, practical stuff, bring, of course, a rain jacket, uh, some suntan lotion, some bug spray. You may also want to bring, if you have a pair of binoculars, uh, and if you have a magnifying glass, especially for that per first part of the, uh, of the uh, exercise. So I invite you to, to that. Great. Sounds fun. Um, yeah, are we doing more? Yeah. I'm, what, maybe, Where's David, one more? Well, this is for, yeah. And then I'm feeling kind of wiped out. Maybe we need a break after this one. Yeah. We've discussed a lot of elegantly complex ideas these last three days, really. Uh, my brain is swollen, I think. Um, there's something that I have found very valuable. A magazine publisher asked a Buddhist teacher to write a 3,000 word, word article on the essence of Buddhism. And the teacher said, well, I don't need 3,000 words. Everything is connected. Everything changes. Pay attention. Mm. In fact, I can make it more simple. Pay attention. 
beautiful. Yeah. And what did the Buddhist say to the hot dog vendor? Make me one with everything? <laughs> Sorry. I couldn't resist. <laughs> Anybody else? So, uh, one more. Go for it. That's right. It's not that complicated. Matt, thank you so much for your presentation, and thank you to all of our speakers this weekend. It's been wonderful. Um, I just wanted to say maybe two quick quotes. One is from Rob Bell, which is, your evolution, your growth is taking a while. And that's just for us to remember that when we leave these four walls, you know, we don't expect everyone to be where we are, to have experienced what we have experienced. And we meet those people where they are and greet them with joy and, you know, and acknowledge that we're all on this growth, this experience together. Um, it's, it's a lot of three steps forward, five steps back, you know, where yeah. it takes a while to grow and growth is painful. Um, and the other is from an essay of my friend's child who was 12 years old when he wrote this. Um, but just a reminder, it's more f of, from the Buddhist tradition, but know that we are all unique, but none more significant. Mm. Yeah. Thank you for those. You know, there's... Oh, the, the, the hike is in the uh, valley floor, so it's all flat. You can go as far. It's not really a hike. Um, it's a dispersing into a landscape <laughs> and finding your own space there. So you can go as far or not so far as you want to go, and I'll orient you to that landscape in the morning. Uh, so we're meeting at 9 o'clock, uh, and it's very easy walking and very easy terrain. Mm. Yeah. Great. So just a quick word on just reflecting on this sense of needing to meet, meet, meet people where they're at. Um, when I think about the evolution of consciousness, I don't think of it as something that we do as individuals. Okay. Um, and these, these layers of, of consciousness that, that gradually develop over the course of thousands, tens of thousands, millions of years, um, they're all still inside of us. And when I feel threatened and I retreat to that fight or flight response, you know, uh, <laughs> All this whitehead stuff goes out the window, right? Because I'm trying to survive. And I know that about myself. And so I think it's important that, yeah, we, we meet one another where we're at and that, you know, Drew gave this wonderful uh, quote from MLK about I can't be who I need, am supposed to be until you are who you're supposed to be and vice versa. Um, there's a Sanskrit phrase, Tvat Tam Asi, which is usually translated as thou art that could say you are me and this notion of that that Whitehead shares with many mystics that the divine is in each of us is a profoundly challenging idea actually ethically the responsibility that we would need to act in the world with if we fully accept this idea um, it's not easy so don't expect, you know, uh, to walk out of here just after having heard the words and then everything's changed. It's a practice, but practice it. All right, thanks for your attention and thanks for your questions and comments. It's been fun. couple of other just kind of information things. One is I've put cards with uh, my contact information out on the... Uh, table out there so uh, I, I appreciate being in contact with all of you also there is a bowl basket at the back of the church that's offerings for Christ Church um, if you want to uh, give a, an additional offering uh, to our congregation um, um, then we do not uh, discourage that and uh, <laughs> just let your heart be your God thank you and I guess we'll, we'll take a half hour break and then we're gonna have this panel at 430
uh, for those of you who want to hear from some of our participants. <laughs> 